You think I'm a hypocrite? Well, you should. I wouldn't disagree with you. The road to power is paved with hypocrisy. And casualties. Never regret. Financial independence. Country shopping. Van nomadism. Security culture. Ethical enclaves. Crypto anarchy. Legal interstices. Survivalism. Join your host, Shane and Kyle, as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vaughn. You're listening to the Vaughn Podcast. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast. I'm Kyle. And I'm Shane. <laughs> what you heard there in the introduction was a quote by Frank Underwood, the protagonist from the Netflix original show, House of Cards. We're certainly glad you decided to join us today. The Vanu Podcast is covered by a BIP COT no government license. Reuse and modification is permitted to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can learn more at bipcot.org. This episode is entitled Collective Movementism, The God from the Machine, and the show notes can be found at vanupodcast.com slash seven. Make sure to go to check out the website again. That's vanupodcast.com if you haven't already done so. Vanu is spelled V as in Victor, O as in Oscar, N as in November, U as in Uniform, vanupodcast.com. Hell, while you're there, go ahead and sign up for email updates so you never miss a post. It's right there on the sidebar. Also, make sure to like us on Fascist Book and Twitter. Fascist Book more so if you're looking for supplementary commentary throughout the week. Facebook.com slash vanupodcast. So, Shane, it's a pleasure to be back with you. How are things going on your end? Oh, hell, man. Can't, can't complain at all. Things have, things have been good, and it's, uh, it's, always, it's always fun to uh, record these podcasts with you. It's, it's, uh, it's actually something positive that comes from it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, since you're now the Mr. Definition Man this time, I suppose uh, you and I should start out by uh, defining some terms. I think that would be a, a wise thing to do. So, so collective movementism, first off. Essentially, it's just an aggregate set of behaviors and actions aimed towards large-scale socio-political change and the furtherance of specific goals. So uh, examples, I mean, the anarcho-capitalist movement would be, you know, collective movementism. Uh, the environmentalists uh, would be one as well. The alt-right, uh, the labor movement, uh, you know, those uh, socialists who, you know, right-to-work stuff and, and things of that nature. The anti-war movement, uh, you know, as, 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 as good as, uh, as it's been in the past, it's, it's still collective movementism. And uh, the well, more, re I guess, more recently, probably, uh, especially with the uh, the Malheur Wildlife Refuge occupation back uh, uh, last year in January, the public lands movement, uh, which uh, unfortunately that's that's actually a thing, uh, <laughs> uh, bickering about public land versus uh, or public property versus private property when you know public land is a contradiction. But that said, uh, but that said, <laughs> go ahead, Kyle. Well, what about the uh, various like identity politics uh, movements? Because I think there are some people who like women's rights and gay rights and Latino rights and somebody else's rights and rights, 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 rights. I mean, aren't those movements too? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And and also there was a uh, uh, one of the last podcasts I did for for the other one I do is uh, the National Anarchist Movement. Like they actually, the, this is one of the very few anarchic schools of thought where they actually like the National Anarchist Movement. So it's actually like well, it's actually a movement. And obviously there's some identity stuff in there too. But that's that's a discussion for another time and not really uh, something we we need to go into here on the Bonnie Podcast. But hold on, just a follow up to that. Would that be like an example of a movement within a movement? I guess that's, that's that's a good way to put it, yeah, actually, because, you know, the anarchist movement is one thing, and then that national anarchist movement combining, you know, some of the – it, the nationalist is, is kind of it, – it's it's not – accurate to what you put what they're they're against nationalism but uh so yeah that would yeah, that would be yeah a, a movement within a movement uh, especially with identity identity politics stuff too oh geez okay well is there any other terms that need to be defined for this go around i think uh when we get more into this uh especially when when we kind of hear what Rayo had to say about uh you know uh, anarcho capitalism and you know limited government libertarians or limited government constitutionalists uh one thing that will come up is utopias 
And uh, uh, there's, uh, the, the definition is just uh, the definition is not that interesting, but the etymology is. So I'll, I'll define it first. Uh, it's an imagined place or state of things in which everything is perfect. There's no no conflict, uh, uh, as as Mises kind of discussed in the in, the, uh, in human action, the, the evenly rotating economy where there's no profits and no with profits and, uh, and, and no debts essentially. Uh, that 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 kind of be a, a you know a utopia. Now the etymology is interesting though. It it, it literally means nowhere. Uh, and it was coined by a gentleman named Thomas More. So the, the etymology, nowhere. Uh, so I think that's uh, that's a really good start to, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, what, what, when we get into uh, what Rayo had to say. Well, let's let's get into what Rayo had to say. So I think it would be fair to point out that in short, Rayo had some issues with the kind of clumsy sounding limited government libertarians, really the minarchists, and the uh, so-called anarcho-capitalists or ANCAPs as they both require a cultural revolution, boy, there, there's a term, maybe that should be defined too, which uh, necessarily entails collective movementism. So let's go ahead and see what Rayo had to say. Quote, both limited government libertarians, LG, and anarcho-capitalists, AC, believe in the deus ex machina. Uh, this means God from the machine, translated into English which will keep their idealized open market capitalism pure. For LG, the deus ex machina is a constitutional government, which has powerful military police forces to discourage foreign and domestic aggressors, yet which somehow abstains from harassing the peaceful. For the AC, the deus ex machina consists of various protection agencies and insurance companies which remain peacefully competitive and cooperative on the whole, rather than fighting each other, forcing people to do business with them, staking out territories and becoming states. Both hypothetical systems are contrary to historical experience." Close quote. So Shane, last time I checked, I think you were a, a voluntarist still. Um, I, 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 think, I think Rayo's kind of having a problem with that. Uh, could, could, do you, I mean, do you think he's off base there so far? No, I, I will say, uh, like when, when I was just getting it, when I was just kind of coming to anarchism, and and, and you know, I found you know circles on fascist book. Uh, it, it did appear to me that you know, the anarcho capitalism or voluntarism was was you know it was on a positive trajectory, and uh, I, I mean may, maybe maybe more people are coming to it. Uh, I mean that, that 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 very well may be the case, but uh, but still, I, I think I think uh, I think his critiques are 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 valid. I mean, yeah, I, I did still consider myself an anarcho capitalist. I think that uh, you know, if, if there were to be some you know uh, cultural revolution towards freedom. Uh, obviously, I don't want. Uh, I think uh, going back to uh, the Constitution, limited government is is not the the wisest idea. Uh, so you know, if, if people were going to you know actually choose freedom, which you know uh, you can consider, you, you got to rely on these uh, uh, the, these naive voters, and then also the, uh, uh, the the folks on the left that are like protesting Trump now uh, with all of their irrationalities. Uh, so I think that that automatically raises a con raises a concern. I think it goes along with what Rayo was saying, but. I don't know. He, he, he explain. He actually explains anarcho capitalism pretty well. Uh, you know the uh, the the uh, the uh, the protection agencies and insurance companies. I mean that is kind of you know uh, what what have been, what has been theorized. Uh, you know since even since Rayo. Uh, that's that's something that's uh, discussed a lot. But obviously no, none of that has been put into action, uh, which which is definitely a problem. Uh, it's definitely a problem considering you know keeping actions consistent with uh, or, or thoughts with consistent with action. But uh, I, 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 there are obviously some, some, some other issues, too, uh, even with, you know, the, the monopoly that uh, the state claims on, on uh, those judicial, judicial services and things. So uh, I, think, I think his critiques so far are, you know, I, I think they're fair. Uh, it, it, he's not coming at it from, you know, uh, like we'll just, I brought it up a moment ago, the National Anarchists, uh, where they, they just hate capitalism. And it, it's all pejoratives. It's all, uh, it's all without defining the terms. Uh, but Rayo, I think Rayo's approach is, is is actually fair. And consider this was you know back in the '60s. So this was you know probably uh, when when uh, anarcho capitalism was at was at its infancy. I mean, Murray Rothbard's body of work wasn't all available yet, like it is today. Uh, and then uh, also, I mean, Mises was around, but he wasn't anarcho capitalist. So uh, I think that kind of also has something something to do with it as well. All right. Well, let's get to this next uh, paragraph of uh, quote, and and let's 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 kind of evaluate where Rayo's coming from here. All right. Quote: Achieving freedom and preserving freedom are really the same thing. 
States can be thought of as bad protection agencies or whatever, but most LG and AC, the minarchists and the ANCAPs, try to separate the problem of achieving utopia from that of preserving utopia once achieved. Few LG are seriously running for legislatures other than for publicity or testing the constitutionality of laws. Even fewer AC are attempting to organize protection agencies capable of defying exist existing states. Even fewer AC are attempting to organize protection agencies capable of defying existing states. Instead, to achieve their utopias, both LG and AC invoke another higher order deus ex machina, a cultural revolution, a fundamental change in the world views, ethical values, political attitudes of most people. Certainly, popular attitudes can and do change, and can and do affect political systems, but LG and AC err in thinking of popular attitudes as something independent of and antecedent to a political economic system. A person's worldviews depend in large part on the opportunities and problems he perceives for himself, so long as he feels subject to the state and powerless to change it, he will rationalize that the state is really necessary, if not good, and will reject out of hand arguments to the contrary, close quote. Now that's very interesting. So hmm. let's let's maybe kind of unpack this a little bit. So he act, Rayo actually does give us a definition for the cultural revolution. Now, let me ask you this first. Do you think the cultural revolution as defined by Rayo in the quote that I just read, do you think that's fair to work off of? I, w I would say, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I would say, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's definitely a good starting point. It's, it's, it's very, very clear. Okay, then if, if that's indeed the case, I think what he's mainly saying in this quote is that what's more important than the difference, the ideological differences and goals of the minarchists and the ANCAPs is actually their similarities. Do you think that's also kind of fair for him to drive at? Well, yeah, yeah. Le leaving ideolo ideology aside, I mean, yeah, they, they both require a cultural revolution that, that, you know, I mean, both are, you know, vehemently trying to, you know, convince others that, the, that their position is, is, you know, the right one. Uh, and, th and then also, too, I think something to consider is uh, anarcho-capitalism, you know, is premised off of, you know, the free market. I mean, n not necessarily. And uh, I think another kind of, you know, uh, point to Rayo here is that he, he, he even back then, he maybe not uh, in this sort of way I'm going to explain it, but he acknowledged this. Uh, that that you know j just imagine trying like convincing like uh, uh, you know socialists to adopt capitalism even the ones that are just the most vehemently against it uh, if that it, like obviously there there are there, there are the, the the exceptions where yeah they came from the left uh, and, and now that you know they're they're free market anarchists but they're the, that's the exception not the rule generally these people have such a vehement like such a, a vitriol against against capitalism and free markets uh, and such such a love and you know. Uh, reliance on the state that uh, to, to convince them to uh, you know to, to convince them through through by way of a cultural revolution is 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 honestly naive thinking. It really is, and that's coming from an anarcho capitalist. So just just keep that in mind. Well, I think that's I think that's pretty profound what you said there. Let me do. Let me just ask you a follow up. Then, do you think just for a purpose of compare and contrasting, do you think something like agorism? would require a cultural revolution or just the counter-economic activity alone would be sufficient to actually achieve like the agor would be able to achieve like the agorist revolution in bringing about Ancapistan, for example. And see, I, I think agorism is a little different here because uh, some folks probably see, you know, as agorism as, you know, just rational self-interest, you know, trying to keep as much money as they possibly can. And then also, you know, going down, going down, you know, lines of production and also just entrepreneurial ventures that, uh, you know, make them better off, uh, as well as, you know, maybe, maybe it's just, you know, kind of civilly disobeying the state. Um, I, I guess as, as, as a whole, though, like as an ideology, like what, kind of, what Konkin kind of laid out, I wouldn't even say it would, it would, hmm, it's a good question. It's a good question. Because I, I I could I could answer I, I I could see it both ways, um. But in re, in regards to this, a cultural revolution, I I I really don't think it would require such a thing as that, uh. Where you know you have to change someone's mind completely. Because once you uh, 
once you kind of introduce someone to, you know, uh, you know, I guess a, a state free economy, you know, the counter economy, uh, and, and they start to see how much better off they can be, it doesn't really require it, it, getting into it doesn't require an like an ideological change. They can still be status and still do what they do, but, you know, act on their own self-interest. Um, so there, there is that, but the long-term goal of, uh, of of agorism, a cultural revolution, no, it, it, I would say it, it wouldn't be a cultural revolution because the underground economy is, you know, it's it's not an economy made up of like the majority of people uh, or critical mass, as a lot of these, you know, um, a lot of these cultural revolutionists will will, will kind of tout. Uh, rather, it's more of a, it's more of a, a small-scale revolution, uh, rather than you know, a, a, like a like a wide cultural one, if that makes sense. You know, it's it's rather fascinating. The you know, when I did my book report on neither bullets nor ballots, I didn't really get the impression, which basically neither bullets nor ballots might as well be uh, the de facto man manifesto for for voluntarism, as far as I understand it. Um, and I think that came along later after Vaughn of the Search for Personal Freedom was 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 written and published. And stuff. Yes, mm -hmm. the impression I get from the voluntarists and and neither bullets nor ballots specifically is that a cultural revolution was not required necessarily to uh, to affect strategic withdrawal, but that a cultural revolution would be necessary in order to bring about Ancapistan. So, mm -hmm. I mean, do you think that's do you think that's a fair uh, assessment, or do you kind of see things a little bit differently? I would I would, I would say that's I would say that's fair. Uh, I mean, voluntarism is uh, uh, especially from you know the the, the content at voluntarist.org. It was kind of you know I guess spearheaded by folks like George H. Smith, Carl Watner, and, and Winnie McElroy, and folks like that. I mean, uh, it's basically premised off of st strategic withdrawal. Uh, you know, getting the people out of state that you can and not participating in politics. That's that's pretty much, you know, the, the, the short and sweet of it as far as I understand it. Um, I don't think really a cultural revolution needs to happen, really needs to happen there. Um, but with with anarcho, with anarcho capitalism, I, I think it kind of I think it kind of does. It's it, it's kind of it's 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 obviously based off of you know presenting arguments of why cat why you know why for the free market is good and why you should adopt the free market and why you should disregard socialism and uh, why we should you know work towards uh, creating the society based off of uh, you know the, the ethics of private property. Um, and I'm not saying those are bad things. I, I'm definitely not. I'm an anarcho capitalist and and a, and a proprietarian anarchist. So uh, I mean. <laughs> well, that's kind of redundant, but uh, I, I mean, getting to getting to that end goal of Ancapistan, it, it really, it really is a utopia uh, because it depends upon the cultural revolution, uh, or I guess the the only the only other possibility is uh, something, that, and we'll get into this more in you know season two, but uh, something like a sovereign free port or something like where, where the state still exists, but anarcho capitalists can do their trading, you know, at least free from relatively free from coercion. Yeah, the the reason why I'm bringing up voluntarism here is because Rayo is criticizing the ANCAPs quite a bit. And I think it's important to to illustrate that I think what the criticism really is, is, is not just the Cultural Revolution, but it's also kind of the question of how to get from here to there. Like, how do you bring about, an, uh, bring about ANCAPistan? And I think that's really more what he's criticizing is the transition uh, methodology, or shall I say, the lack of one, right? I mean, he's basically saying, well, you can't transition from statism to Ancapistan vis-a-vis uh, -vis a cultural revolution. And, I think and, and, and he also, and, and he also mentioned too, um, that uh, he said, uh, let's see, uh, but most L quote, but most LG and AC try to separate the problem of achieving utopia from that of preserving utopia once achieved End quote. And, uh, I think that I think that's also another critic. You know, getting there, but once you get there, how do you preserve it, and it, how, how does it not devolve into another, you know, another state? I know there's been a lot of there, uh, not not when Rayo was alive, but since then there has been there has been quite a bit of literature on that, uh, you know, as far as theorizing how how it could possibly work, but uh, uh, I don't know. I, I I still think you know Rayo's critiques are, are are valid, and I think they're 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 ones that you know anarcho capitalists you know you, you know. Uh, try to uh, you know refute and also try to you know uh, <laughs> I don't know set up some of them DROs and things. <laughs> That's just me.
Well, I mean, I, I mean, definitely in an earlier episode of the Vanu podcast, it was mentioned that even if we were living in Ankapistan, we would still need Vanu, mainly True. the private criminal element, whether it's organized crime or just, you know, muggers, burglars, rapists and such, right? I mean, the criminal element you'll always have with you. So, yeah, I think in terms of this, this particular quote uh, of Rayo, this paragraph or so, where he's really kind of criticizing both the minarchists and the ANCAPs. I mean, the minarchists kind of make sense. Of course, the yeah. the ANCAPs was also rather interesting because it was a two-pronged thing and then pointing out the similarity there. And I think the other similarity, too, is it's, it's the way that they're going about doing it. I mean, even when he was criticizing the minarchists, he was saying that, you know, they're not really getting into office, right? The anti-libertarian libertarian party is not actually getting people into uh, the Congress, for example, or even into their respective several state legislatures and so forth, right? Uh, or even county sheriff, because those guys are largely elected. At least they definitely are here in Texas. So, you know, the, the, the LP, they're not doing it. You know, how many and how many of those guys also, except for, of course, some of the uh, fellows up in uh, New Hampshire and specifically in the Keene area, aside from certain localized pockets, how many uh, you know, how many self-identified libertarians who favor limited government for whatever reason, how many of them are testing the constitutionality of laws, especially vis-a-vis -vis a combination of uh, uh, <laughs> civil disobedience uh, combined with jury nullification? Yeah. How many of those guys? Yeah, you see, there. It's so the point is that the cultural revolution is not happening. That that and also too, I want to point this out because I mean I am an anarcho capitalist as, as I've said, and, and and some of the people I know some of the people here listening to this this podcast are are as well. Now I, I want to I want to point this out that Rayo Rayo here is criticizing you know the the act or action I guess rather lack of action uh, in, in regards to you know put, pushing forth uh, these these stated goals, but he's not criticizing you know like 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 the uh, non aggression principle. He mentions uh, the case for rational uh, non coercion or so, it's something along those lines. One of the chapters in the book um, so like the non-aggression principle uh, yeah he's he he, 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 he adopts that uh, he, or he adopted that or if he's still having he may still adopt it but uh, so so he adopts that and he also voluntary interaction he, like I mean hell like free from coercion I mean uh, if, if, if there's coercion it's not voluntary like that's something that you know Vanu is premised off of so he's not rejecting anarcho capitalism from you know uh, some I guess uh, some nefarious way. He's 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 simply you know criticizing the action it would take to get there, and then also how it's how it's preserved once it's achieved. So I want to point that out. This isn't this isn't one of those those socialist communist communistic disagreements with anarcho capitalism, or one that Noam Chomsky would put and say, well, well, anarchism is actually from this actually should be on the left. Like this stuff, this is the bastardized version of it. No, this isn't something like that. This is like an a, a an intellectually honest critique, uh, and, and one you know premised off of action. Before I get on to the next quote, let me ask you this then. Do you think it would be fair to say perhaps that the lack of a uh, strategic transition in order to achieve one's goals, whether it's limited, the hypothetically limited government or, or in Kapistan, and especially vis-a-vis -vis a cultural revolution that maybe, well, maybe even the cultural revolution itself might be indicative of controlled schizophrenia like we covered in the previous podcast? Hmm... Some for you if, to see, yeah, and, and I, I guess just just real just real real briefly. Um, obviously, a, a lot of the focus, and I, I have a lot of people on fascist book, what in groups and, and friends and all of that stuff, uh, and 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 it's focused on it's focused on the philosophy portion for the most part. Uh, but what I think what I think could be valuable, and, and there have actually been a few other folks who who have been who have kind of said similar things to me, and this is something I've kind of held for for a while. Uh, so it's good to see that. But rather than you know uh, like, like convincing people of you know the efficacy of, of voluntary interaction and, and free markets. Uh, rather, you know, uh, something like ethical enclaves or agorism, where they can actually try it themselves and see the benefits firsthand, uh, if if they are so inclined to even try that. But I mean, you, it, it's 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 really really, especially when people are are, are you know brainwashed. I mean, the definition of brainwashing, the inability to, to like actually hear uh, other opinions. Uh, it's going to be really hard to, to to you know convert a lot of those folks. Uh, so I think you know uh, whether whether they whether they see you like uh, if, if they see you doing it and they say wow you, I mean. You, you, you're actually a lot more wealthy. What, what the hell are you doing, Shane? 
Uh, and it's like, well, you know, I'm just, you know, ethical enclaves of and whatever the answer may be. And then they can actually try it themselves and, and, and test it out to, and, and, and see if it's efficacious for them as well. So I think rather than, you know, the, the philosophy and the non-aggression principle is great. I like the non-aggression principle, but I actually haven't really talked about that much in a while. But, uh, but uh, I think more, more so trying to just, uh, rather than the, the whole philosophy thing, I mean, anyone can do Vanu. Uh, anyone can, you know, practice agorism and, you know, trade in the black and gray markets. I think the the, them seeing the efficacy of it um, could help them to, you know, uh, get rid of those collectivist spooks in their head uh, a lot faster than, you know, you telling them all about the non-aggression principle and why they're socialists and communists, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I mean, so sometimes uh, people don't really respond well to what they would uh, subjectively perceive as 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 proselytizing, but yeah, let me let me just add this onto that before we get to the next quote. I would just say this. I would say notice also how the minarchists, um, you know, can talk a good game about restoring constitutional government, but even when some of their most prominent uh, figureheads and and intelligentsia and just people <laughs> in general tell them like, hey, you need to go set up local committees of safety already. You know, stop with this political. Yeah, you know, even they'll tell their own people, stop with the political crusading. And this was even before Trump. Stop the political crusading. Stop voting. Stop this mainstream stuff, and go set up a committee of safety already. Uh, what have the Patriots done since the Harney County Committee of Safety was established back in uh, December of 2015? It's a good point. I'll, one 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 sense. One sense. So there was one new committee of safety set up in Harney County, and since then it's been essentially all about Trump. So there you have it. Yes. Yeah, so the point is that the likely controlled schizophrenia of the minarchists with their committees of safety, and yes, even the ANCAPs with the dispute resolution organizations, or DROs, as the old Molyneux would put it, and, and other people as well. Um, you know, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I can't find a COS or a DRO anywhere. And seriously, I would love it if there were alternatives to the state that were these organizations or businesses or whatever that could actually uh, be some, if it's not fully privatized, at least on the, in that direction, but it just ain't happening. And that's just a cold, hard reality. It is February of 2017. You know, it doesn't take three years to set up a committee of safety and it doesn't take five years or more to set up a DRO or even a private defense agency. So, I mean, that, that's kind of the other thing. I mean, say what you mean, mean what you say, be consistent. And so let's get on to this next quote about cultural revolutions. Quote, long range cultural revolution activities are not of course to be deprecated merely because they will not bring freedom in our lifetime. When making career decisions, the individual is of course, primarily concerned not with the benefits that a cultural revolution will bring to everyone sometime in the dim and distant future, but with the benefits he will personally gain as a result of his work. Are there ways to bring about a cultural revolution much more quickly that, uh, than that has been thought possible, say within a decade or two? Close quote. Well, that's rather interesting because I think with well within a decade or two it would have been around what nineteen ninety or so. So yeah. no, definitely not. I mean, just look what happened with the so-called ANCAP movement in less than a couple of years. I mean, individuals can't even remain principal when it comes to the most powerful position in this so-called excuse of a country. Yeah, yeah. So, so the the resounding answer here is is no. But let me. I just I kind of thought of something while you were reading that. I mean, so, so obviously with, with, with the more, the more freedom-based strategies, such as like, uh, uh, you know, anarcho-capitalism uh, and limited government, for example, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's uh, other than, you know, bring people to the philosophy, which, you know, I mean, that's, that happens with both of those uh, sometimes. But I don't know, could, 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 some, could, could one make the argument that the left has been effective in, in like actually in a cultural revolution because you, you consider the overtaking of like uh, of intelligentsia and then you look at, uh, I mean, uh, the majority of people in the United States uh, as far as their, their, their voting habits and things. Have they been successful in a cultural revolution? I'm kind of just spitballing here, but that, huh? Um, I if if there was such a thing as a cultural revolution, then yeah, I would agree with you that welfare statists have largely been pretty successful, right? I mean, you hear from the so-called uh, right, really the totalitarian right, conservative fascists, basically, 
You keep hearing from them all the damn time about, oh, the leftist mainstream media with its movies and television shows and music industry and, you know, pick a form of media, basically. Uh, that they have changed the values of our proud American blah blah, and it's like okay, okay, that's that's rather interesting. But but it was but it wasn't it wasn't a cultural revolution like in, in the sense that Rio defined it because it wasn't it wasn't you know like uh, you know discussing something like okay you know uh, Kali you're right Vanuism is probably the best strategy you know you you've convinced me it was more subversive it, it was more sub subversive than that you know through the public schools and things so I don't think that can be considered a cultural revolution actually even by Rayo's definition. No, exactly. Simply, simply because it's it's deceptive, it's it's subversive, and there's not you know rational thought going into it. Where okay, you know that seems that actually you know the you you've won me with your arguments. So uh, let's uh, I'm, I'm on your side. Like it wasn't it wasn't really anything like that. That like that's just kind of the default position, right? Well, yeah, and even look at something like identity politics, which is all based on collectivism of of different stripes, different flavors, and and different definitions, and and collective aggregates of people based on superficial characteristics. Like, I'm sorry, somebody's ethnic makeup, somebody's gender, somebody's sexuality, somebody's pick a, a demographic characteristic. These are incredibly superficial, because what actually matters is individuality. Like, I'm sorry, um, I, I said this before in, in, in older articles of mine, but I, I think it bears repeating again. Society does not exist. Literally, it doesn't. If we're talking strictly like existentiality, it doesn't exist. I mean, oh, where's, I mean, you hear people talk about society all the damn time, right, Shane? A society, mm -hmm. so, okay, like, oh, I, I'm society, or, we we can't we we can't be a society that doesn't let anyone come here that doesn't want to yeah it's like stuff like society, that we have to take your guns right to so society we need the federal reserve system you know depreciating the dollar you know we have to it's like like every every claim of tyrannical impositions upon people's lives is always done or commonly done in the name of society or the common good or pick an excuse uh, you know or it's the law, or my personal favorite, I'm just following orders. Yeah, that's you military men, you soldiers, to you specifically. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's rather interesting, isn't it? So you have the society, and wh who is society? Where is society? Can I call society up on the phone? Where is, I mean, what is society? It's just this big monster going, douche, douche, I am society. I mean, this is, it doesn't exist. It's a collectivist spook in one's head. I think you. I think you said earlier uh, to use that phrase you used earlier. It is a collective spook, and really, at best, society is really nothing more than a convenient linguistic descriptor for a collective aggregate of individual units. You know, it's, 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 it's simply just a great buzzword to get all of the collectivists on board with something. That's essentially like a, it's, it's. It's been very useful too to them, uh, yeah. to to the state. It's been very, very useful. Yeah, I mean, like, we, the Russian communists, must protect ourselves from the evil capitalist pigs, and we, the German national socialists, must protect ourselves from the odd combination of gypsies, homosexuals, and Catholics, and other people. I mean, this has been used by tyrants constantly, by the states more spe somewhat more specifically. You know, it's, it's just, collectives don't exist. Okay, there are, there is no such thing as Americans, literally. Yes, you have about 300 million some odd souls on this portion of the North American continent from this latitude and longitude to that latitude and longitude. But if we're talking about reality and what literally physically exists, that's true, but there is no such thing as America. It doesn't exist. It's a figment of your imagination. Hell, even it's, uh, it's, 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 it's like what the uh, sociologists would call, uh, you know, like a gender and race. Uh, it, 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 seems, it, appears, it seems like a social construct. It is a social construct. I will agree with them about that, at least to that degree. And hell, well, even <laughs> Frederick Bastiat, Mr. Limited Government himself, Mr. Frenchman back in the day, even Frederick Bastiat defined the state as that great fiction by which everyone tries to live at the expense of everyone else. So Mr. Limited Government Bastiat is saying that the state is a great fiction. Okay, so whether you're talking the, so the, no the notion of a nation or a nation state or government or the state or whatever, these are just fictions. And it, it just pains me, Shane, 
where people start playing these identity politics games, even before the whole the social justice warrior thing really kicked off back in probably about 2013 or so, and just has remained really, really in the news cycle ever since with, with its political correctness. I mean, there was some of that beforehand, of course. I think, I think there was a term that you used in the past. I think it was like cultural Marxism or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean... So, I mean, in one sense, it's not anything new, but it really gained a lot of steam during Obama's second term. And now with Trump, it's, it's almost like Trump's alt-right is a neo-reactionary uh, fascist type, well, reaction to that kind of identity politics. But of course, the way in which they did it is with their own identity politics of, this, of stupid lies like white genocide. I mean, think about that, too. I mean, hell, there was, when I had an interview, uh, not that, uh, you know, a, a podcast live streaming interview with, um, oh, actually, I can say this here, you know, with Maggie Rose, I was, I was sitting there, like, waiting between commercial breaks, and Revolution Radio, they were basically playing these ads I was listening to when we were starting the second hour, and I was hearing about, like, this, like, one of these ads for these other shows basically saying, we're going to tell the truth about this thing and this other thing and that other thing and white genocide and then, like, something else which sounded vaguely credible. And all I'm thinking is, wow, they're, they're like, treating this white genocide thing like it's real. And it's like, how are you guys? So here's what I'm getting at. How are you guys in the alt-right any different from the social justice warriors you claim to oppose? Both of you are playing identity politics. You're just using different characteristics and upholding different characteristics of black mm -hmm. versus white, of, man, of men against women, of, of even the old versus the young. Hell, I mean, the only thing we're winning at this point, actually, well, hell, they already did the whole Muslim versus Christian thing with the Muslim invasion doom porn scenario. That's not true that I've written about before. And so notice that the, the use of identity politics to really prevent any sort of unified resistance against the state by the people. Yep, that's a good point. That's definitely... Uh... So instead of having... So just to finish my thought up here about, about this, this element of it, notice that instead of having any sort of real collective movement where we might be able to do something like abolish the state, instead of something like that, now you have this multiplicity, this anti-free market, really, of, of collective movementisms that are all, you know, at each other's throats in this great, great democratic republic of ours, really democracy, in this great democracy of ours, uh, where they're at each other's throats because they're trying to vie for power uh, from the state, aren't they? I mean, that's just what it is. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just you know, uh, whether it's, you know, the uh, the minarchists, the limited government constitutionalists, the uh, libertarian, the anti-libertarian libertarian party, uh, the anarcho-capitalists. I mean, they're, they're just, it just seems like everything is kind of fracturing. Uh, and and I guess maybe that's good for decentralization. But 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 but, but when you look at when you look at you know the, the reasons why these fractures are happening, it's it, it it's not it's not a good thing. It's not something like you know oh more decentralized service. It's not it's not something to be happy about. Uh, it, it's just you, you, you're witnessing controlled schizophrenia at work. You're witnessing uh, you're witnessing you know the failures of collective movementism and why Rayo I think was correct. Uh, when when he kind of said that like th this this can't happen. I mean it's just not it's just not it's just not rational. I mean uh, it's just it's just not possible. No, it's not. And also you notice the use of the pronouns constantly, especially those um, plural pronouns. You know, we, us, ours. My yeah, even even the national anarchists did that all throughout their goddamn manifestos. So uh, that the national anarchist movement. Let me toss that in there because that's actually relevant here. It's a movement, and there throughout the entire manifesto, we, us, ours. Uh, I mean, that was the entire thing. <laughs> yeah, and and so notice, like, there there is no such thing as like an individualist movement. Thank you. That's exactly where, that's exactly what's on my mind. So yes, there, there, there's no such thing as an individualist movement. Thank you. So yeah, so as, you know, even, even when I was reluctantly a minarchist, I was always very uh, mindful of my own individuality and kind of the more, kind of more broader, somewhat vague concept of, of, of individualism and individualist. And I've always been that way and I will go that way to my grave. 
So I'm very, very sensitive to collectives, whether they're the so-called voluntary collectives of the syndicalists, whether it's the collectivism that's coercive by the state or whatever else. I've been very, very sensitive about that all my life, even though I have changed ideologically in certain types of libertarian shades from one kind or another, but I, I was always very sensitive about my individuality. So like these past several years, what I've been really kind of working pretty pretty uh, intensely with, with a variety of, of, of like the patriots, they are incredibly collectivistic. And so in some ways it was almost kind of painful to me to work with, with many of them, which is why eventually I only ended up working, at least up until recently, with, with really only a handful of them because they were the only ones I could stomach. And in Well, yeah, the, 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 collect, the collectivist thing is kind of a necessity. I mean, it's all about America. It's all about Americans. Like it's, that's... Patri it's, it's even called the Patriot Movement. I mean, literally, I mean, that's what it's called. And so, yeah, whenever I, you know, hopefully soon, when I finish up that, uh, that, that history of the Patriot movement, I've been very slowly writing over the past several months or so uh, in between other things, and I finish that, I think that history of the Patriot movement will be kind of a, I don't want to say a microcosm of the macrocosm, but will be a type of case study that actually reinforces the more fundamental thing that Rayo's bringing up here about the failures of collective movementism you know, on, on the big, big picture, the bigger, big picture, if you will. Because, <laughs> I mean, hell, even look, at, even look at, like, the preamble to the federal constitution. We the people, blah, blah, blah. So right there, the first three words are automatically problematic, aren't they? Yep. We the people do ordain and establish the constitution, provide domestic tranquility, and do a bunch of other bull crap that never actually ended up happening about securing the blessings of liberty and such. So we, the people, did this stupid constitutional thing, which might have been a good experiment, you know, for its time, considering classical liberalism and everything that that involved. But quite frankly, it did say we, the people, in it. So yeah. who, you know, I mean, hell, I mean, we, the people, but who are we? Well, if you listen to, uh, what was his name? Justice Taney, I think it was, whoever wrote the decision in Dred Scott v. Sanford which, oh, by the way, was, has been universally considered the worst U.S. Supreme Court decision ever for, for anybody of a more legalistic bent. I mean, the, the judge basically said it's Caucasian natively born people. So not natively born people of other stripes and flavors in terms of their skin color, quite literally. No, it's only the people of a broad European ancestry that happen to be born on this portion of the North American continent. They're the only ones who count as we the people. He literally said that. It's not my opinion. That's what it said in Trescott v. Sanford. Yeah. So, and that's why, and as a side note for people of a legalistic bent who like to play legal interstices, see previous podcast, uh, earlier podcast on, the, on legal interstices. Um, yeah, that's kind of problematic, and that's why, you know... Uh, <laughs> That's why Scott didn't have standing to sue Sanford because, well, let's just say his skin color was a little darker than they liked. But yeah, we the people, <laughs> but who are we? And this is why I don't like collective movementism is because they do crap like this where they say we, us, ours, but there's, but it's like violating the first tenet of any philosophy whatsoever. Define your terms, young man. Define yeah. your terms. And I don't, I don't know who's we. We the people. Well, who's we? Us. Wait, did I join up with something? Who's in us? Our yeah, yeah. As 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 Michael Dean says, and he, he caught me on this once when I was on, when I was on the fiends with him. But uh, I said I said we once, and like I I I think very like I, I think about what I say and make sure like I try, I slipped up. It was it was like one a.m. and I was tired, and I slipped up and said we, and he said uh, who's we? Do you have, you have a mouse in your pocket? <laughs> uh, so like even like that that's the stuff I I, I really do think that. Uh, something positive uh, could could really be you know uh, not using like this, this collectivist language. Uh, I know like I, I slip up. I I, I, I would say that uh, it's really really easy to do. Um, but uh, I think uh, you know being conscious about individualism and how you know only individuals exist and the society doesn't exist. And as Kyle kind of said over the past uh, you know half hour or so, uh, it's all about individuals. And I think, you know, uh, uh, and I think even in the last podcast, you mentioned something about, you know, our language has to reflect that. And uh, I think that needs to be uh, something similar here. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's just kind of the idea here. Sorry, something, you said something interesting. I, I that, that sparked a thought of me. I want to kind of get this on the record. You know, it's, it's rather interesting that cultural revolutions as Rayo has defined it here seem to kind of take on a life uh, lives of their own, don't they? 
where it's all about giving people a false hope. And it really becomes self-perpetuating after a while, doesn't it? Like, like it's, it's, it's almost, sorry, you just brought up something in my head too. So um, it's almost like what I've said about the, the anti-libertarian libertarian party. So people are like, these individuals are so disgruntled with politics. Like they're oh I'm so sick of the Republicans and the Democrats and the Libertarian Party comes in with you know they the, they come in on their on their cape and they say well there's a third way you can join the Libertarian Party right, only only, only we've only we've never only we've never had any success whatsoever we've only gotten like maybe like two percent of the votes ever and that's being awfully generous and we hardly ever get people into office come join the Libertarian Party here's what we stand for. And uh, they go to the Libertarian Party, and they're like, oh, this, this sounds a lot better than what I was, you know, it sounds a lot better. And then they uh, waste a whole lot of their a whole lot of their time and uh, and all of that. But but but, you know, collective movementism is kind of the same thing, regardless of regardless of what it is. Uh, like uh, I'll even say this about negro capitalism. It might be kind of, you know, it might be kind of contentious, but they cancel their voter registration. Uh, or this individual in question cancels their voter registration and they say, OK, I'm an negro capitalist. Now let's build in Capistan. So, uh, uh, you know, whether it's it, obviously p people have different goals. And, and obviously, when I when I first came to anarchism and you know, anarcho capitalism, I was naive. I, you know, I, I, I thought, you know, like we're on our way there. Like, look at all these people that I'm, I'm meeting on fascist book and like we're we're we're, we're getting there. Like, it, it's it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I know it is. And uh, I mean, it may not be nefarious. It may not be anything like that. But, uh, you know, advocating for any collective movementism and, and bring people into that without you know uh without giving people options you know in the meantime ways to find individual freedom because that's what really matters right that's uh also deceptive it, it's obviously not not nefarious like libertar the anti-libertarian libertarian party uh it's obviously not nefarious like that but it's just something to consider uh and, and obviously with 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 uh with with both of the podcasts that, that i do and including the, the tvp I mean, yeah, the, the 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 objective is to you know create more volumes here, and the other one is to create more practitioners of direct action. Um, but when you bring someone into an ideology or a new school of thought, at least give them something to do, something to create more individual freedom. Uh, if not, and, and you you, like, you you rescue them, so to speak, from from this authoritarian hellhole. Uh, whether it's the anti-libertarian LP or you know the left or the right, and you you bring them into this this ideology that's all you know philosophical with no action, I think that's also very very bad. Yeah, and that that is kind of the cultural revolution too, where it, where it's all philosophical, and even if it's a hundred percent accurate and true and all that, if you don't give people something to do, and by giving people something to do, what I mean just to be more precise is you make suggestions, you make recommendations for things that they can do to improve their own lives. And it's been funny, the reactions I've gotten, even from, uh, I remember the one, uh, not really a debate, really the informal yelling match on that other broadcast a while back, uh, with me and James Babb, who pretty much is a wannabe politician, and he was accusing me of issuing orders when I was just making... I've, making I've got, I've... I got accused of the same thing when I posted a uh, uh, the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action onto oh, yeah, uh, right. on, onto a post at Modus Peace Liberty Fest. You're, is, you're issuing. It seems like you're issuing orders. No, issuing orders. No, I'd issue, I'd order you to do one thing. I said, you know, check out Direct Action. Like what what the like it, it worth like a hundred of hundred hundreds of options. So, uh, yeah, issuing orders. That like, that's. It kind of it goes back to the last the last broadcast where you you kind of get that uh, that pushback when it comes to you know actual solutions. Yes, and and that's that's kind of like a when when the when when they um, when those critics basically say you're you're issuing orders, that's just a baseless accusation. Like unless you really are issuing orders and in context, but that's not what happened. We're making recommendations. We're making suggestions. You you know you know who's issuing orders though. Vote for me, your freedom loving oh, that's politician. Right. Right. That's not the same though. No, it's not because you know voting's voluntary, and so is direct action. But you know. <laughs> Fuck! I, I can't keep this shit straight in my head anymore. It it's just so nonsensical. But it is, but but it's controlled schizophrenia, like we mentioned in the last podcast, right? So oh, and actually that's a good point you brought up. So with this collective movementism, oh oh, we we can totally do the political crusading, and that's not issuing orders. When well, yeah, go oh, yeah, you're protesting. Go down to that street and yell a bunch and wave a sign, and then go to the other street, wave a wave, a, you know, look like a hooligan and and use your bullhorn and make a and you know look make yourself look like an ass. 
and maybe even block traffic occasionally. Uh, though that, that's not issuing orders at all, even though it totally is. But it's totally not issuing orders according to the cult controlled schizophrenics and collectivist movementism people. As, but as oh, long as he promotes direct, a direct action, oh, you are the worst. Uh, pre, you know, <laughs> Augusto Pinochet followers ever. I mean, it's completely nonsensical and Orwellian to the extreme, Shane. Oh, man. They accuse, you, yeah. they accuse you of what they themselves do. That is exactly what's been my experience and even your experience with the controlled schizophrenics and political crusaders who push collective movementism. And see, and I think here, here's, here's what the crux of it is. So if it's in line with collective movementism, if it's something that, you know, that we can do, then it's okay. But if you try to break away from collective movementism and try to do things like if you try to promote, like, you know, lifestyle changes, individual lifestyle changes uh, or things like that, it's automatically, you know, just, just disregarded or, you know, kind of uh, looked down upon because you aren't part of this movement. And therefore, we don't care what you, have, what you advocate for, or what you say or anything like that because – you know, it goes against, you know, uh, uh, it goes against our, you know, restoring constitutional government. It goes against, uh, it goes against, you know, uh, uh, limited, just limited government libertarians more, more generally, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, I think it's the separation. Um, like you, you need, you must be part of this group or else we don't care about you. Yeah. Or, and, or not even, or not even, don't even just leave it there. It's, it's a little bit more than that, right? It's kind of implying you're a bad person, even for suggesting to people that there's more to life than just this movement or whatever. And so that's, that's the thing. I mean, you know, there is no individualist movement. I don't even think there's an anarchist movement or even probably most scandalously at all. There is no such thing as a liberty movement either. Cause I've heard that all over the years. Oh, I'm a liberty activist. What the hell does that mean? Seriously, people, ask yourselves. You've heard this from guys like Taryn Lupo and and the other guys out of New Hampshire and and guys just all over the place. You know, it's it's a liberty movement, and I'm a liberty activist. You know, your local neighborhood friendly liberty activist is part of the liberty movement. Like all these catchphrases, none of it's ever being defined. So they're violating philosophy, you know, basic tenet of philosophy right there. Define your terms, and even when we can get something approaching an operate <laughs> an operational or working definition. It's this ephemeral fluff. It really is the collective spooks in one's head, isn't it, Shane? Yeah, and, and the last example I'll provide is uh, this was oh, probably a, a year ago, uh, and I was I, I liked trolling the Libertarian Party, and you know, I like the Libertarian Party here, and I like trolling uh, the McLean County Clerk, but this isn't related to the McLean County Clerk. But uh, I posted the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action onto uh, well onto one of the McLean County Libertarian Party posts, and I know who posted it. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna expose the guilty here, uh, but. Uh, and I, I kind of left a comment too, you know, like uh, reject political crusading. That's not that's not a way to freedom. Rather, why don't you try direct action? I posted the freedom umbrella, uh, the, the the FUDA, and uh, and uh, this individual said something along the lines of, uh, uh, you know, some of those things seems good. Some of those things seem good, but if uh, it, it, but if if you want to like exit society, but if you want to you know remain in a part of society and like uh, you know in uh, like live live in a city. Uh, politics is definitely important and it was just like so dismissive and like this guy like he, he's one of the older gentlemen uh he's such an asshole i i <laughs> i can't stand him but that that's personal that's my my personal opinion but uh oh like just the the response that i got from him oh it was frustrating it was super super frustrating but uh, i think we should probably begin to uh to, to close this out well as we begin to kind of close out here i think there's a there's a couple things i'd, I'd like to mention so you know, there have been accusations about individuals hurting the movement. I'm sure you've heard that term before. Oh, yeah. Whether that be offering constructive criticism in good faith, as I have done throughout the years, or speaking out against the anti-libertarian libertarian party, which you've done. Um, but the truth of the matter is that there's no such thing as an individualist movement, an anarchist movement, or even a liberty movement. I mean, freedom and liberty, the or as Rayo had put it, the complete absence of coercion or the general exemptions to coercion, they're intensely personal elements of one's very humanity. And so subjecting them to the whims of others is not approaching those who falsely imagine themselves to be our rulers from a position of strength, to say the least. Oh, yeah. So when you look at like these various sociopolitical movements of, of various flavors, I think it's very important to really appreciate and understand 
the truth. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this is what I'm. Well, this is honestly what I think is is the truth, or at least getting very, very close to it, is that socio-political movements rarely achieve their stated goals because more often than not, as they grow, as there are you know an increased number of self-identified adherents, and more people are claiming to adopt their professed values the actual adhesion to said values actually becomes diluted over time, which is actually the, the whole uh, source of the derisive phrase cultural bowel movement, because it becomes so self-contradictory and, dare shall I say it again, control, like, like filled with a bunch of controlled schizophrenics. That's why any of these socio-political movements never really achieve their stated goals. You know, actually, that's the other thing. That's, that's a good point, but... There has to be some sort of like, you know, broadening of principles or broadening of goals, because in order to get more people to join, you have to, you know, you have to be, uh, you know, attracted to more folks. And I think that's exactly what's happened with the anti-libertarian libertarian party. Not saying it was good from the start, but uh, if you just look at the words of, uh, of the founder, what the, what, the, what the hell is his name? Founder of the LP, uh, from from that speech that he gave when he when he started the LP to yeah, when he was on. Yeah, when, when he was on Lou Rockwell's show. Uh, I think that's uh, that's that's very very uh, that's yeah, that's very LP very very filled, telling. The LP, you know, is filled with a bunch is a filled a class of mini bureaucrats who are just interested in perpetuating the institution as an institution and so forth. Just a loosely term. Yes. So you're onto something <laughs> there. That party archy, as Sam Conkin put it, and so forth. So yeah. And, and then and then and then it becomes. I mean, you, you, obviously, I, I think honestly that these people start out these movements with like you know, uh, well intentioned. But you know, as it grows, and as you said, the, the 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 goals become diluted. They they become more expansive, and then uh, beyond that, I mean, uh, uh, I think there there's also you know an incentive, a monetary incentive here too. Whenever you whenever people are joining the organization, they realize that there can be membership fees and all of that. And you know, the people who uh, you know are in the bureaucratic positions, you can, you can make quite a bit of money off of it, and not actually you know pursue or uh, pursue as they would have um w without uh, you know the way the the way it was, it was set up uh so i think there's also a financial incentive there too that comes down the line uh when you know the, the cash cow is discovered so to speak yeah it's a lot like the the state with its perpetual warfare isn't it where it's just perpetuating itself endlessly just existing for its own sake so the moon yes will never be over it's not supposed to achieve its goals. The patriots are not supposed to restore limited government. The ANCAPs are not supposed to achieve a or you know, get to ANCAPistan. The, the gay people are not supposed to be respected or the women's rights people or the blacks or pick somebody out of identity politics. None of them are actually supposed to achieve any of their goals. That's the point. Because, yeah, the, 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 the NAACP couldn't, like, they'd have no reason to exist if there wasn't, you know, that sort of conflict between races. So, uh, yeah, th this for these movements to exist, that problem has to remain. And uh, and obviously, as you know, uh, you know, conditions, you know, get get better, as as you know, the race relations have gotten, uh, then. Uh, like then then rather than you know going after like the major ones like uh whatever they may be i can't think of an example off the top of my head there, there just have to be like minuscule ones like oh he ref like uh or, or like uh, for the gay one he refused to bake me a cake i'm gonna go cry uh, like like it th there uh, it, then it kind of ends with like the, these very very mini minuscule things uh because you know it has it still has to be a perceived problem it has to be a perceived problem yeah, next thing you know, you have fake grievances, like I've written about before and such. So if anyone was being really honest, the truth is that there is no unity, there is no solidarity, and there never will be. The best really any of us can hope for are to have collaborative, productive, fulfilling relationships with other truly like-minded individuals. And that, quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, is that's about it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, because everything I've done to free myself, I've either done alone or I've done with other individuals through fluid peer-to-peer -peer relationships, you know, such as you, Shane. And that's, you know, why I've said that organizations don't matter, but relationships do. And you don't need a collective movement to have good relationships. I'm sorry. It's just, but collective movements do need organizations, don't they? You just mentioned the ACLU a minute ago. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I guess... What what I don't want like this to kind of portray is like you know 
all people are bad or, or anything like that. Uh, you know, you, you know, a vulnerable society. I mean, that there's going to be like uh, ethical enclaves, people trading. You know, uh, having those positive, trusting relationships is is, is good. But uh, but it's the formal organizations that that Kyle and I are kind of speaking to here. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, obviously, individual relationships are important. Kyle and Kyle and Kyle and I, you know, going back uh, uh, almost two years next month. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, there, there's been no formal organization. It's it's simply just been you know, uh, you know, tr uh, favor trading initially, and then you know actually like you know uh, uh, collaborating on a bunch of stuff. And it's been a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that, like that sort of thing will certainly exist in you know a vulnerable society, but it's uh, it would be based it would be like an individualist base is not uh, some you know massive organization or even a small organization at that. Uh, now, as far as like uh, there could be like the, those some mutual aid sort of things, but uh, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't look it wouldn't resemble anything. Uh, like what we've discussed uh, so far on this podcast, right? And and one of my great discoveries that I do think is is uh, definitely uh, supports what Rayo was kind of getting at is that I've discovered there is such a thing as a disingenuous activist, and there is such a thing as fake grievances. And so when you look at collective movementism, I think the evidence, whether from back in the 1960s or nowish. I think is being pretty consistent for the most part that a lot of people will fill themselves fill themselves up with a lot of arrogance and hubris that they're an activist they're changing the world look at me I'm yelling like an idiot through a bullhorn I mean that's that's where the level not to get spiritual here but that's where the level of consciousness is generally speaking uh, at least from what I can observe and so yeah with I mean certain exceptions here and there and people I can work with and such but that's, from what I can tell, that's not the norm. The norm is to do, like, stupid crap in Portland, Oregon, for example, just being one place where people are doing, where the protesters, the activists are blocking traffic and causing a ruckus and not actually changing things for the better, whether they be well-intentioned or no. It's, it's just not happening, but they're part of a movement because they don't, just don't like the president or, you know, the Trumps, the Trumpster, as it were, you know, and, and that, that's kind of where it's at. They have a movement of being against Trump. I mean, that's not standing for anything at best. That's just being against something, but you don't even need a movement for that. I mean, look, I mean, there are certain things I personally don't like. I don't need to get into a gaggle of other idiots who similarly don't like that other thing I like. I and mean, we it can be something petty, like, uh, a movie or or pick something and we don't need to pick it outside the movie theater saying that we have we are the movement that doesn't like this particular movie and therefore we're <laughs> somebody I, i'm being i'm being facetious here ladies and gentlemen but i don't know maybe maybe it's a little bit more accurate than not i'll leave you folks up to judge that so here here are the takeaways there is no such thing as a movement period i don't care about the subject matter or what they claim to profess there is no such thing as a movement, period. So therefore, there is no possibility of hurting the movement. You can't hurt, hurt said movement that doesn't exist, okay? That would be like saying, you're torturing a unicorn. The movement is the unicorn. So it's kind, <laughs> of, it's kind of evocative of the state itself being equally fictional. Equally, of course, because we all have to be equal. It's, it's evocative of the state being injured, especially where there's no injured party to be found. I mean, that's the whole Victim, basis. Vict victimless crimes. Exactly. Yeah. That's the whole basis of that. So it's all about these fictions. So you have the fictional collective movement with the equally fictional government, and it's fiction, 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 fiction. I mean, very little of this has anything to do with reality, at least up until we're talking about use of force issues and things get real, right? And, uh, and and can, and just, just to reiterate this, Bonnie was, is, you know, a strategy – focused on reality. Yes. This is why these, these things have to be pointed out. Right. And so another takeaway here is that, and this, this bears repeating, collective movements rarely achieve their goals because as more people join up, the more diluted the message becomes. And I guess another takeaway would be is that once you realize there's fake grievances and disingenuous activists, not all to be sure, there are useful idiots, then I don't think you would, I don't think anybody of a rational or sound mind would really, you know, really want to join up with these movements. And as we start to close out here, Shane, I would like to take just a few minutes and run through argumentation ethics. Because, I mean, this is the perfect opportunity to really just kill collectivism dead. <laughs> please, if please anything, do. <laughs> if there's anything I despise and hate more than the state, it's collectivism of all flavors. Because... They don't exist, and they are nothing. They are the nothing of the nothing, if there is such a thing, okay? So here's Argumentation Ethics 101. 
All right. So this entire podcast and also all of our other ones, right? Uh, right now, I'm currently talking, and then in a moment, you'll talk and say something. You'll just talk. Can yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. So my statements are my statements. Your statements are your statements. Each uh, of whatever we're saying, it doesn't really matter the content particularly. Uh, we're self responsible for the statements we make. They are ours and such. So in the, even in the very act of communication, which is what we're doing here in TVP, even in the act of communication, we are expressing property rights. We are expressing self-ownership. And uh, last time I checked, Shane, uh, how many people are involved with, with TVP, or at least when we make these episodes? Well, just you and just, just me and you. <laughs> oh, 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 well, wait, wait, where's the... Wait, I, wait, can I find the collective? Oh, wait, that's right. A collective is not making this series. You and I are. So, yeah, yeah I, we, we, we are, but, uh, but that, that's actually an accurate we. You, you, we, Kyle and I, yes, we're making this podcast. <laughs> right, so the point is that the statements that I make and the statements that you make are attributable to, to me and you respectively and so forth. Therefore, because we're expressing property rights, we're expressing property rights absolutely and completely. And so, and it's all individually based, right? My statements are my statements, your statements are your statements. And so that, that's kind of a, that's a very, very quick argumentation ethics overview. But I think what I'm trying to say here is that argumentation ethics, which is a logical proof of, of the libertarian or private property ethic, really also, I think it also does another thing too. I don't know if Hans Hermann Hopp really thought of this or not. Maybe he did. I think it also proves individualism and debunks collectivism like forever because it's provable in the moment not some distant past like in other places or even on this continent and not in some hypothetical future scenario wonderland with like sci-fi technology or whatever but today right now here in this time and place with you and me and Jim Bob down the street and our listeners, of course, our, the listeners who happen to listen to TV. <laughs> <laughs> right. In the moment, today, this moment, the, this moment you folks are hearing this as well, this is all individually done through uh, self-ownership and as expressing self-ownership, this moment, now, today, and forever. This is it. This is the reality of, of what we've been kind of pushing this entire time. And so anybody Indeed. who's promoting collectivism, I think they are dialogically stopped, quite frankly. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would agree. I would agree. You know, uh, the Libertarian Party doesn't speak. The environment, the environmentalist groups don't speak. I, I, I can't argue with like the Libertarian Party logo. I just can't do it. Like or, or whatever it is, I just can't argue with it. I can argue with individuals that associate themselves with the Libertarian Party, but I can't argue with this this collective this collective fiction uh, known as you know. I can't argue with all of them at once. Like I, I can't argue with this entity that's like all of them combined. Like it just doesn't make any sense. And no one with you know, no one with a rational. Well, maybe some Marxists might agree. Might might actually you know think they can argue with them, but uh, they they believe in a lot of a lot of ridiculous things anyway. So they aren't really a focus of this conversation. But I, I think I think I, I definitely think you're right. Okay. I think it can be applied to collectivism as well. One example I want to I want to add to that before we close out here. You know I've been arguing with people and the and the patriots, the constitutionalists for years. I've never actually argued with the patriot movement. That's the collective. But I have argued with individual constitutionalists in private conversations at length. So even demonstrably in those specific moments, you know, uh, even I, I, I think the collectivism is kind of spoiled. And so some of our conversations over the years were kind of getting a little awkward at times about the patriot community as, as how they see themselves and all. It's like, wait a minute, I'm talking to you specifically. You are talking to me specifically. What is this collective? But of course, I didn't want to ruffle their feathers too much because I honestly didn't think they were ready for that. Uh, maybe I should have made an issue of it before. I don't know. I, but I guess we all learn from our mistakes, I suppose. At least, I, excuse me, excuse me. I learn from my mistakes. Let me put it that way. <laughs> so you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of funny too. I mean, we, we both we both kind of screwed up in the, the collective. It's 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 as I said before. It's it's easy. It's it's easy to do. It's easy. It's really easy to do. For the first like 18, 19 years of my life, it was all collective as shit. So I, I've gotten a lot better, Kyle. I, I mean, I, I hardly ever hear you do anything like that. So you, I mean, yeah, you're you're getting you're you're obviously good at it too. But but God, it, it, it's 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 a, it's I mean, it's 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 a it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard heroin to quit. Yeah, it, yes, and it's a bad habit. And obviously, you know, uh, you and I and Jim Bob and whomever else can kind of chide each other. 
point is that I personally think that if you apply argumentation ethics even to uh, individuals uh, who are arguing with each other, I think it actually supports individualism and a priori demonstrates it in the moment uh, and, and really kind of debunks, because collectives, again, society can't, I can't argue with society, society can't argue with me. Hell, even different societies, the blacks and the whites, the, you know, the Syrians can't argue with the Iranians or the Americans or the French or all of these collective labels, right? Um, there's no way for, for these people to argue with each other in collectives, right? Only individuals from, that have these labels attached to them, these collective labels attached to them, can actually individually argue with each other, right? So if I argue with that particular Frenchman, okay, then something real is actually happening there. But unless that's actually happening, all these other ways of describing it are basically ephemeral fluff, really. So as mm -hmm. we'll end uh, out here with a quote by Rayo. So any talk about continent-sized free societies of whatever kind brought about by whatever means is strictly utopian. Remember, I think that means nothing, right? Such talk may be a pleasant diversion and may help convert the few who have libertarian potential. But in the real world, liberty will be limited for a long time to come to self-liberated individuals and perhaps libertarian mini-cultures and free ports. But this is not the grounds for pessimism or defeatism. One can forget about the herd and become free once he exorcises the collectivist spooks from his head." Close quote. So, the question for all of you is this. Can you exorcise the collectivist spooks from your head? Again, to repeat the question, can you, the listening audience, exorcise the collectivist spooks from your head? The website is vanupodcast.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you next week.